All right, once we have gotten approval for the system request, the next step in the project management workflow is to conduct a feasibility study. A feasibility study is made up of three parts, technical feasibility, economic feasibility, and organizational feasibility. Each one of these asks a question. The first one, techni the technical feasibility asks the question, can we build it? Can we build it means how familiar is our development team, our IT team, with the particular business area. If it's a business area that we know nothing about, the risk of the, the project failure increases greatly. So let's say, for instance, Walmart. How familiar is Walmart with the tune-up shop? Oh, I forgot Walmart actually does have tune-up shops. What about if Walmart wanted to expand in a gas station? Well, Walmart actually does have gas stations through its Sam's Club. What about banking? What if Walmart wanted to go into banking? How familiar are they with that particular business area? And I would say that Walmart becomes more and more familiar with it every single day. We also need to know how familiar the development team or the IT team is with the technology itself. We all use mobile apps, and we may be on Facebook and Twitter, but has our IT team actually program those or coded those into an existing system. Because the less familiar they are with the technology, the more the risk increases for the project. When asking the question, can we build it, we also need to take into consideration the size. How many features does it have? A larger program runs more risk than a much smaller program. We also need to take into consideration its compatibility with our existing system. The more divergent the two systems are, the more difficult it is going to be to integrate the two of them. For example, the first contract job that I had, a doctor's office wanted to electronically bill his patient so he could receive his payments for services rendered a lot faster. After evaluating his system, it quickly became evident that he not only did not have a modem, but he didn't have internet access, but yet he was adamant about being able to electronically bill. So how compatible is his current existing system with the new one? And what kind of changes or adaptations are going to have to be made in order to be able to integrate the two systems. Once we've decided if we can build it, the next question is, should we build it? Because just because we can build it doesn't mean that it should be built. So in order to decide if we should build it from an economic feasibility point of view, we want to conduct a cost-benefit analysis. And this allows us to look at the development cost, the operational cost, in comparison to the benefits or the cost savings that the, pro that the project will bring to our company. So the first thing that we want to do is break out a spreadsheet, and we want to start writing down the list of some items. The first one is development cost. If you look on page 58 in your textbook, you'll see the four different categories that we're going to list on a spreadsheet. The first one, development cost. These are one-time costs. They only occur through the development of the software itself. For instance, the salaries for the development team or the programmers who actually write it, any office space or equipment, hardware or software that has to be purchased in order to make the project feasible, the software system feasible. For instance, we had to buy a modem and gain internet access in order for the doctor to be able to build a client online. The second type of costs are called operational costs. These are ongoing. So even after the system has been developed, these costs continue to be paid as a part of the new system. Operational costs such as hardware repairs, hardware upgrade, training the users on how to use it on an ongoing basis, maybe software upgrades or licensing. So we have a spreadsheet with our, that is listing development costs and operational costs, and we also want to list the tangible and the intangible benefits. How we're going to be seeing savings through this new proposed system. So the tangible benefits, as we mentioned before, if you put tangible and intangible benefits on your system request, you should be able to copy and paste those directly onto this spreadsheet. Just mark down the things that we can measure as tangible benefits and the ones that we can't necessarily measure as intangible benefits, but that will um, increase or benefit the company. So once we have listed these things on the spreadsheet, the very next thing that we need to do is we need to assign a dollar value to each one of the items on this list. So the one-time cost, like the team salaries for the developers. You say, I don't know how much developers make. 
One of the best places that you can go is online to Google and you can do some job searches and find out exactly how much developers, programmers, senior managers, system analysts, how much they make and then you can average that into the system. And the, one, the cost of the hardware, the software, you can do Google searches to find out online how much that sort of stuff costs. You say to yourself, I can find out how much a developer makes, but it, how do I go about estimating the time that it would take to build the system? Well, there's a couple of different ways that you can do that. Analysts generally would consider past projects that they have already developed, maybe industry reports, maybe in, um, vendor information. Now, these kind of approaches are not going to be as accurate, and I know in this particular homework assignment, we don't have any of those available to us. So it's going to be an educated or a best Yes. Keep in mind that these kind of estimates are going to change over time. They'll be re revised as the project proceeds. So you'll notice at the top of the figure on page 58 are excuse the intangible benefits or the benefits. We're adding dollar values to the benefits now. And it's pretty easy to add a dollar value to I'm going to see a 25% increase in sales if I know how much the current sales are. It's pretty easy to determine that I'm going to see a reduction in my inventory cost, a 10% reduction in my inventory cost, if I know what their inventory costs are. So you're going to assign a dollar figure to those. What is a slightly more difficult is how to put a dollar figure to the intangible benefits. How do I put a figure on improved customer satisfaction? Well, you might say to yourself, if customers are dissatisfied with my service, they're calling into my customer complaint line, and I have four full-time employees whose job it is to answer that customer complaint line. If I increase the satisfaction of my customers, I'm going to decrease the number of calls to that complaint line. Therefore, instead of needing full, four full-time employees, maybe I only need two full-time employees. So think creatively as you try to decide how to assign a dollar value to the intangible benefits that you listed on your system request and that you have put in your spreadsheet. Once you have put a dollar value to the benefits and the cost, the next step in the process is to project that across five years. So you're going to take those values and you're going to project them out to five years. So in your spreadsheet on page 60 in your textbook, we're going to notice that they have taken those benefits and those costs and they have projected them from 2011 all the way out through 2013. Now I see that there is a steady 6% increase at the top of our chart. There's a steady 6% increase in sales over each of those five years. But I also notice that there is a fixed value for the reduction in customer complaint calls and the reduced inventory cost for each of the five years because those values are not going to change. <clears throat> the next thing that I see is that we have included not only our one-time developmental costs, but also our ongoing operational costs in here. Of course, the one-time development cost is shown on the chart. There is only a dollar value in the first column because all of the rest of the years, there is no cost involved in that particular charge. But with our operational cost, if you'll notice the hardware, the hardware begins at $54,000. It increases to $81,000 and pretty much stays fixed for the rest of the four years. The same can be said of software. The software maintains a fixed value of $20,000 for each of the five years. And then the operational labor is going to increase because of the cost of living increase. So this spreadsheet that you see on page 60 in your textbook, you're also going to find the template in your chapter, in your homework two instructions. That assignment link will have a spreadsheet template available for you. So if you open up the spreadsheet, you're going to see, it's going to look slightly familiar. We're going to see across the top of the page, TB stands for total benefits. So in lines three and four, you're going to take the list of total benefits or all of the benefits that you identified and you're going to copy them into lines three and four, adding more lines as necessary. Then you are going to display the, the first year cost and each of the projected five year costs across columns C through G. And then you're going to change column or row five to summarize all of the total benefits for the year above it. You're going to do the same thing for total cost. Row 11 TC stands for total cost. In rows nine and ten, you are going to copy and paste all of the ongoing and the one-time cost that you have identified for this new system, along with the cost for the first year 
and then you are going to indicate the cost as you projected them out over five years, and then you will change row 11 to summarize all of the total costs that you have identified. Once you've added those values to the spreadsheet, you're going to notice a couple of very important things. Two things that we want to take into consideration. The first one is a return on the investment. Row 25 shows a return on the investment based upon the numbers that we have coded into the spreadsheet right now. And a return on a, an investment is the amount of money that you receive in return for the money that you spend. The higher the return on the investment, the better the investment is. So let's say that I have $100 to invest and I take my $100 down to Wall Street and I invest in some wonderful stock and at the end of six months my $100 is only worth $50. That is a poor return on my investment. But let's say I take that same $100 and I invest it in another stock and at the end of six months I now have $1,000. That is an excellent return on our investment and we use that number to determine the risk associated with the new system. The second thing that's going to be important about this spreadsheet is finding what is called the break-even point. And the break-even point is the length of time that it takes for my initial investment to be recouped by all the savings that I made. So let's say, for instance, I want to buy a high-efficiency furnace because I understand I'm going to save a lot of money on my electric bill. So I'm going to make up some numbers, but I pay $100 for my high-efficiency furnace and I find that I am saving $10 a month on every one of my electric bills. How long is it going to take me to save or recoup my $100? Well, if I paid $100 for the furnace and I'm saving $10 a month, that means at the end of 10 months, I will have saved the amount of money that I paid on the furnace. And in the 11th month and beyond, all the money that I'm saving is just cherry, is just uh, frosting on the cake. It's just savings right in my pocket. But let's say, for instance, that I paid $10,000 for my high-efficiency furnace. Now I find out that I only save $10 a month on my electric bills. What is my break-even point now? It is going to be considerably out into the future, and I might just decide that it is not worth my investment. So another one of the numbers we want to know about is our break-even point. If you look on row 21 on the spreadsheet as it stands, there is a number that is decreasing in value. It goes from 2.6 to 1.6 to 0.6, and then in the fourth column, it drops below zero. That is when the break-even point occurs. If you'll notice on the graph that you can see on the chart, the red line is my cost associated with the new system. The blue line is the benefits or the savings, the money that I will be making or saving off the new system, and the point at which those two lines cross is my break-even point. So if you're going to notice, we will break even on this new system somewhere within the middle of the third year. So now I'm going to change some of these numbers and see if we can change our return on investment and break-even point. If you'll notice, my total benefits in the first year was about $600,000, climbing every single year. The total cost of this particular system was $1.8 million the first year and roughly a quarter of a million dollars every year after that. So this is about $2.8 million or somewhere right there that I've paid over five years for this particular system. What happens if the benefits to my company are not as high as they are listed on here? Let's say that the benefit to my company in the first year is only $200,000. The benefit the second year is $200,000. The benefit the third year is 210000 Oh, I added one too many zeros to that. And then we will say 210000 and 210000 All right, so if you'll notice, the return on my investment is now a negative 63. I have just invested $100 in the stock market and came away with $50. Not a good return on my investment. If you'll notice my break-even point, my cost far outweigh, the red line is much higher, the cost far outweigh the savings. The blue line is significantly lower and they never cross. All right, so let's see. Now it is costing me somewhere roughly a million dollars. The benefit to my company based upon row five is a million dollars. So now let me change some values to, the, or to make some changes to the total cost. 
So let's say that it cost me $200,000 the first year. Oh, I need to add one more zero. The second year, it is going to cost me $20,000. The third year, $25,000. The fourth year, I don't know, $100,000. That was $10,000. And in the fifth year, I'm going to spend 150000 because my management team gets a huge raise for doing such a great job. Now you're going to notice on line 25, row 25, my return on investment is 107 So I invested $100 in the stock market, and five years later, I have $1,000 in my pocket. That is a great return on my investment. You're going to notice on my break-even point, that the line, that the system is going to pay for itself within the first year. And then the benefits to the company every year after that are going to far outweigh the cost of the system after that. And so these lines, the break-even point is in the very first year because the system will pay for itself in the very first year. So these are some made-up numbers. You're going to be conducting a cost analysis, you're going to be creating a cost analysis for rich and famous car rentals as a part of homework two. The third question that we would ask as a part of the feasibility study is organizational feasibility. If we build it, will they use it? We're going to continue this conversation in the next recording.